Right. Tell us your names. I'm Steve. I'm Jeff Nate. Steve, would you like to say your full name? <laughs> yeah, I'm Steve Kim. There we go. Hey. Hi. Um, tell us about uh, your first, um, the first time you saw a Cal Poly float. Oh. Well, first time I actually saw the float in person was um, winter of 66 um, in Pasadena with my brother. And he was in Cal Poly at the time. He was a junior. Uh, yeah, he was a junior and uh, took me up there during Deco Week and uh, we got to uh, pedal the, the flag on the back of the float that said, you know, Cal Poly University back then. And uh, the, the experience I always remembered from back then was being underneath the float or under the scaffolding when uh, we were finished pedaling the, the, the tail section and somebody yelled something like, yo, and looked up and they had dropped a, a bucket full of, um, of, of floral glue. And I looked up, you know, quickly reacted and caught it like, oh wow, that was great, but caught it upside down. <clears throat> and it, it oozed all down the front of my shirt and my, well, mostly my jeans and my thighs. And, and we weren't going home that night. So we had to sleep on, I had to sleep on the floor of my dad's pickup truck. And, uh, Needless to say, it was a very memorable uh, introduction to Rose Float, so that was it. But it was, and I've been here ever since, so it was good. Mm -hmm. Jeff? So I grew up in the Pasadena area, over in a place called Eagle Rock. And so we went to the parade frequently as I was growing up, but I never associated Cal Poly Universities with a specific float in the parade until I actually came to campus in the fall of 1980. And then when I realized what was the camp, what the campuses were doing, I joined the program right from the start. My first float was Snowpoke and got to do wonderful things like crawl through a fully decorated caterpillar to do a few, effect a few repairs, um, nice memorable moments like the welding going on in some cases above us. Uh, so learning very quickly how to how to work around welds and how, how to, to work around the, the mechanics of the float. Probably the first Cal Poly float I actually remember as, as a memory of a Cal Poly was in the, uh, I think it was the 79 Cub War float that actually broke down on the corner of Orange Grove and uh, Colorado Boulevard. And they spent probably like five minutes running around the float trying to get it fixed and uh, I can just imagine the uh, advertising that the uh, campus got out of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, can you tell us the years you worked on the float and what your positions were? <laughs> if you can remember. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know if we had titles for things back. Uh, I started at Poly in the fall of 71 and uh, got active in a fraternity. So didn't get in, uh, actually too involved with Rose Club right away. And I never, I don't even know if we had a club back then in um, 72, 73. Um, and so I was kind of just there. And so it was never a club, because I didn't even know if we had a club, uh, or a committee. Um, but I lived right over here on Murchison. Um, kind of the colonial apartments, and uh, it seemed like all the committee guys kind of lived there too. I was living with two of them, and um, loved uh, you know, putting things together. So we did a lot of late night uh, working on the floats, and probably, what was the name of the float with the Cyclops, mm -hmm. what they call that? Um, Monster, Monster Matinee? Matinee. Mar Monster Matinee. So Monster Matinee was probably the first one, what was that, 73, 74? 73? 73. Yeah, so winter, yeah, 73. So that one was, um, you know, and, <laughs> and, I, and I was starting in college in 1968, so to, to actually work on in 1973 was, uh, you can imagine, well, two different colleges, and I kind of enjoyed college, so I didn't take a lot of time uh, rushing to get out. So um, I love to cook, and it's, uh, I just couldn't see these guys, you know, surviving on sometimes just plain old hamburger. So I, I kind of took over the kitchen, and uh, then they officially gave me a hat that's now in the archives where it says Rose Float Chef. So 
uh, I don't know if it was chief or chef, but anyway, a chef. And um, yeah, and I've enjoyed uh, cooking for them pretty much ever since. So myself and a few other people started cooking for the kids uh, around Thanksgiving and, and move out. Started with the sneaking in the, the cigars and the champagne before it became kind of a tradition and, uh, and, and always enjoyed cooking. And so it's something now that we do quite a bit of. And, and the club, the, the group has grown from maybe 30 back then to like 200. And so it's, it's uh, definitely need a lot more help for cooking. So it's nice to have the help. Oh, and then as far as how long, well, uh, through the 70s, the 80s, the kids seemed to think that they didn't want a lot of help from alumni, so, and I had just gotten married, and uh, yeah, those were your, your years, and it was like, it's our float, hey, get out of here, and so, yeah, there was four or five years there in the mid-80s mid where um, I would come down and look around, but didn't get involved too much, so it was more into the 90s and where they actually asked for some help. And I had already been a certified welder for the iron workers for so many years, and so to help build some of the mechanisms, and uh, which I really love to do, and and you know, I can't even remember the floats, but yeah, I've got pins for them that are so heavy on a hat, I can't wear the hat anymore, so. Um, but it's just, it's been a joy. And then been on the board for 20 years, something like that at least about 20 years and was president for the 50th in what 98 99 something like that mm -hmm. 2000 whatever so uh, yeah you know after after 60 the memory is about you know so i keep jeff around and he helps me out, so he remembers all that stuff <laughs> kind of scary yeah it's kind of scary yeah. my dad said just don't ever get old it's a little tough not to do that and jeff my first float was the 81 snowboat campaign I was one of four, what they called back then, outstanding freshmen for the year. Eventually went into the electronic side of the float, took over some of the programming from Dennis Brown, who's, who had created the original program to help animate the float through the uh, Rockwell System 6502 microprocessing system that we had at the time. I told you, he's smart. We'll try this. He remembers all that. Well, it's important. That's why I say it for the camera. Yeah, I keep it. Yeah. So the, the next year for Way Out Welcome, that's what I pretty much did, was just do the electronic part. And then with Cats at Play, the 35th anniversary float, I was assistant electronics. I actually wrote on the float. During the parade, as we went by the Channel 5 booth, we actually talked to Bob Eubanks, Stephanie Edwards during that parade. If you I take a look at the that. film, you'll see it. For the 84 campaign, I then moved more to the off-float positions. We took over publicity, photography, as well as assistant chairman, as they called me at the time. And then, for the 85 campaign, I became the overall chairman for the Pomona campus. Uh, through that era, through that time frame, uh, good working relationships with San Luis Obispo, a lot of those folks you know, still good friends with. Um, and it was, it was nice, because I know that the relationship has ebbed and flowed, but the fact that after all these years, even with the university splitting in 66, that you know, both campuses have been able to do that. And so it's, it's been great because as I went into the alumni, I had to serve on the alumni board as an alumni president for a while, did the, did the Pink Line newsletter for a while as the editor of that. You know, I've built relationships with folks like uh, Kurt Kruger up in San Luis. He was the editor of the Float Lines at the time, which is their newsletter. And so we exchanged the newsletters. And so I've had at least some, some semblance of a relationship with Slow off and on through the years. Uh, just you know, trying to keep in contact, trying to make sure I understand their half of the history so that we're keeping that in, in, in fairly representative in the Rose Float Special Collections that we have on the Pomona on the campus. And so even as late as last year, there was the San Luis Tribune that asked for permission to take some of the, to use some of the pictures that we have up on the site through the Cal Poly Pomona University for some of their articles. And so it's, there, even you know, from a media standpoint, there's a good relationship between Pomona, San Luis Obispo, and, and so through that, you know, I've been able to help on the floats, not only on the float, because I worked effectively on them through the early 90s, and then really got into the, the Rose Float Special Collection and driving more of that, and so through the alumni and, and trying to keep our history alive is kind of where I've been putting a lot of my emphasis when it comes to Rose Float for the last 20 years. And that year, the historian 
Technically, I'm, I'm the historian. Recognizes the historian on the board. Yeah. I maintain the the Roosevelt Special Collection, and so you know, we we try to do our best to, to run tours through there to keep the the folks on campus understanding of the history so that they stay engaged with the program. Especially this year, you know, we have a, a new president on the university, President Coley, who is very interested in the Roosevelt program. So it's great to be able to have something to show more than just. Okay, here's what we're doing for this the 67th year, but hey, here's what we've done in the past. Here's the things we've been able to do. You know, we've been documented in everything from Road and Track to Omni Magazine um, back in the 80s. You know, we've had various special interests come out and want to have Rose Float and the Cap Poly story told in fun and unique and different ways. And it's given us opportunities to get the kids not only to learn by doing experience here on campus where you're having to learn how to build a project where you have to meet the deadline period in the story, have to work with other people to get that project done, and oh by the way, you also get experience working with the media and doing other activities that are out there. I mean, we've done everything from the George Putnam, we've had folks representing Cap Poly on the George Putnam radio show to actually part of like Egg USA, which is now, the, the documentary is now actually up on the um, new YouTube site that we've been trying to establish and advertise out there to kind of document the history a bit in a quick way to even, um, you know, like PTLA pre-shows. So there's a lot of, for the kids, there's a lot of activities they can get into, a lot of things they can learn. For the program and for the university, there's a lot of interaction and a lot of, of activity that just really emphasizes what we do here at the university. I think he's Italian. I am. <laughs> Not. We do it all in a bigger way. You know, it's a great organization. You've got to talk with your hands. I know. The picture's worth a thousand words. I know. It's a big word, too. You use some big words. Okay. Back to the story. Right. What was your favorite moment from your time on float? Oh, I can't talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> I can't talk about that. Oh, well, best time on the float. Uh, on Cal Poly's float. Yep. Best time when you're a student working on the float. Oh, Your favorite moment. Let's see. That. You want to tell one when your alumni is working. Remember, I remember all the beer, but remembering the events is something else. Um, best event. I don't know. I think it was, it was just being around the chairman and the you know the co-chairs, the just the guys. We'd come over here, and we'd go out for pizza after we worked at the lab and. Um, uh, after things quieted down, then a small group would come back here and we would work on the float, just maybe, you know, eight, six or eight of us. And I think some of that was the, the more memorable times when, uh, you know, the more serious work we did with, with you know, guys you hung with, you know, a peer group. And uh, I guess you could call it a click, you know, just the, the guys that were more mechanically minded that did the serious welding and, um, and uh, it's good and bad because the guys that I remember from then, I, I'm having a real hard time trying to find now. So hopefully maybe through the pink line, which, um, which is going to get out there and with nicer stories and whatnot in it, that maybe we'll be able to find some of these guys from back in the 70s that, um, you know, it, I mean, it was just the whole activities and experience that it's hard to pinpoint any one particular moment in time. So. You know, she won't tell, and I can't tell, so it's just the way it's going to have to be. <laughs> but she was such a, you know, anyway, moving around. Jeff? So you're saying we can't talk about a set yeah. of cannons? No, no. Oh, no. we did have that cannon. Oh, oh, that, yeah, we can't talk about the cannon. Okay, we won't talk about the cannon. We'll we can talk, talk about the cannon. Oh, uh, I don't know. Yeah, we used to blow the mind of the police department. Yeah. Things would get to be a lull, and Bruce and a few other guys would come out, and we'd have this pipe that was had on a stand and we kind of aimed it down toward the gate and we'd fill it with a settling and put a projectile in it and light this thing and the explosion almost shattered windows and we'd immediately go back to work and the police department would come cruising back around and it was like what the heck was that <laughs> was what oh no we, did, we didn't hear anything you know and somebody be running back with a projectile under their shirt going no, we didn't see or hear anything at all. So it was like, we just like playing games with the police department. So you had to do something for fun. 
Mm -hmm. We had the big guns. They yeah. had, then we had the, the, the big tubes on, on some of the floats that point toward this field. And then they would fill them with acetylene, and I'm not sure what they packed it with. But anyway, when they let those off, it, you know, it was like a you know, 50 millimeter cannon or something going off, or maybe bigger than that. I mean, it was the pipes were this big around, they were pointed out this way, so we probably knocked a few windows out of cars on the freeway. So, but that's what we did for fun. Mm -hmm. Memorable moments. Okay. Yeah, I'm sure there's a few more. But it takes oh, a, takes a while for them to settle in. <laughs> It'll, no, yeah. there, there's hundreds of. Them. Oh, there's, there's a hundreds. There's hundreds of them. Probably for me, the the favorite moment was. Between the 84 and 85 parades, up until 84, the club officers used to run out onto the parade route when the Grand Marshal came by, and they would hand them pins and postcards or well, yeah, whatever memorabilia, you know, they might give them a shirt or whatever, just to say, hey, thank you from Cap Poly for the parade and the whole 20 yards. Well, for the 85 parade, they came to us, the tournament association came to us and said, well, you can't do that anymore. There's just too many things going on in the world, whatever, you just, we can't let that happen because then anybody can still do that. And so we said, great, but I was chairman at the time, and I said, but would it be possible to have the Grand Marshal then come to our float and we can give him a tour of the float and give him the stuff then? And they said, sure. Well, the Grand Marshal was Lee Iacocca, who in the mid-80s was quite a, a big name in business. And so the favorite moment for me was really spending 30 minutes with Lee Iacocca Interactive dialogue, walking around the float, showing them the stuff, letting club do their thing with them, you know, give them the, the memorabilia, whatever. Because it's just, it was kind of the the, the the epitome of all those years in Rose Float. And at the time, the chairman were the ones that worked with tournament directly before the, we got into the advisor having to do that. And so for me, it was just that, that whole end game of starting out, not knowing anything, you know, four and a half, five years later being able to work with tournament, work a deal like that, and be able to have that kind of time with, a, with a, somebody that was pretty important at that time, which was just something neat for me to say that we were able to do that. Okay, and to let you guys know, we're gonna have two more questions, okay? Oh, uh, two more. So now we got a new battery in, here oh, we go. Uh, okay, that means we gotta like, we gotta, all right, we gotta stop the slide. Okay, last two questions. No one's gonna watch this whole thing. I know, it's yeah. too long. Well, say, uh, you'd be surprised. Okay. The last two questions are going to be, what's your favorite prank or most memorable prank you guys did? Because I know uh, you guys did them. Oh, so I don't have to be while I was a student? Not while you were a student. Well, I it. recommend it be when you're a student. But <laughs> prank. The most memorable. I know most memorable prank during while you're a student. And, or you oh. can tell them when you're alumni as well if you want to tell multiple. Right. And the last question is going to be, any closing words that you want to tell? The time the construction troop crew went through, this is when Ward Palmer and you know, Todd Dice and some of these guys were around. They, they grabbed all the fire extinguishers and started shooting them at everybody. Yeah. And so the folks in electronics were called the nerds at the time. Thought it would be fun to. We just hid in, in what was then what we called Nerdsville, the electronics room. It was a little room in the, the lab itself that we could lock and close so nobody could get in. So then they proceeded to shoot the foam fire extinguishers underneath the door. And we probably had a good six inches worth of foam in that electronics room over there. We were sitting on the tables. and so. Those are, those are some of the, probably the wilder things. I think you guys are wilder. That we can talk about. It. That, that we can talk about. It. Yeah. I don't know. Um, I think back then I was, I, I was shy. I must have been shy because I don't, I don't remember pulling any pranks. Um, probably watching the guys do it. Um, but I think I was, I come from private schools, you know, and they, they kind of beat being... Uh, I think it was too many cannons going off, got to your too, head. Too many cannons, Shoot yeah. Your head too yeah, much. yeah. My ears were ringing for four years and I just, uh, I couldn't do it, but... Um, I mean, everything was a fun time and, and a lot of things to laugh about, but I, I don't remember a particular prank. And uh, it, it'll come to me about tomorrow, at, you know, maybe after a good ball movement or something, I'll... I'll remember something from the 70s, but uh, <laughs> you gotta have a little sense. You gotta have a sense of humor. Hey, you got. So um, anyway, uh, yeah, you know, uh, pranks. I wasn't much of a prankster, so I can't help you out with that. But like I say, something might come to me, but I'll send you a note. Okay. All right. And final question. 
Do you have any closing remarks for any of the current students or future students? Or just tell to the other alumni? Yeah, I mean, for the students, um, you know, sometimes they take on working with Rose Float as just a, uh, a project, you know, something to you know, start and see that they complete rather than it being you know, a lifelong experience that you know, uh, it's going to add to their character, be a building, you know, a character building activity and something they'll appreciate. And because they appreciate it, that they'll you know, want to be part of the Alumni Association or just active, you know, just uh, don't have to join uh, if they don't want, but it's just there's so many students that have gone through probably thousands of them that have gone through in the last 40, 50 years, what, well, 60, some, 60 some odd years, that um, you know, we've kind of lost because uh, one reason or another, you know, families are just you know, occupations or they, you know, they've moved to you know, South Africa or something, you know, just <clears throat> that you, you don't see or hear from them. So it, it would be nice if we, uh, if the activities of the Alumni Association based on you know many of the younger students getting involved and uh, and bringing their memories and their stories to um, to light in situations like this instead of just you know, going back and digging us out from underneath the rock and you know, having an interview with so um, and it's been in my blood so I've been active with them for uh, for the better part of four decades it was only during his time that they, they didn't they didn't want my help but um, uh, any other time, uh, you know, it's been it's been a joy to work with the students, and hopefully that they will feel the same way and want to come back and give back to uh, the activity. So, so you know, Rose Float will live on. Your turn. It is. Yeah, I know. Well, there's so many things to say. Yeah, but we'll keep it short and sweet. You need some water. No. Okay. It's okay. The, Rose Float, I understand, means a lot of things to a lot of people. There's all this cliches, there's a lot of stuff. But it's what's really fun is, like as an example, with a meal that's still provided to the kids in December, that was started by an advisor in the 80s, you know this. You know, he had this great meal that then the alumni picked up at some time in the 90s, and it carries on, but not necessarily the story. And so it's getting the stories out so people remember and that people understand. You know, it's, it's not just, because even like what I found this year is with the current students, a lot of technology, like building mechanisms that for us, you know, in the 80s, that's what we did a lot of, almost everybody knew how to build them, was something that needed to be reinvented. You know, recently Dale was able to take a group of electronic students through the archives, through the special collection see some of the old gear, and now they're emulating some of it, you know, through the DC control panel, through the animation control panel. To be able to, to, to keep the story contiguous, really we need everybody's involvement. We need everybody, if, if, even if you can't get the time down here personally, if you can, and, you know, anyone watching this, if you can put together your story, if you can put together details of when you were around, remember things, if you have old, old engineering diagrams especially, you know, not just stories about, yes, old. like the mechanisms oh, oh, from the dinosaurs oh, di di and, and the snail and the stuff like that. Yeah, thanks, pal. It's okay. All right. I'm not far behind okay. you. Okay. Or far ahead of you. Whatever okay. That is. I know okay. where you live. That's right. Okay. You're, 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 we're different eras. We're both dinosaurs to a degree. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah, you're going. interrupting a great Keep team. going. <laughs> you're doing a great job. <laughs> We're on Harvey, Harvey, you know, Evan Costello. Okay. We're there. Who's on first? We're going to take this on the road. Okay, I know. That's right. on second. Okay. That's right. So, so, so anyway, if I can right. beseech, you know, anyone out there that has, you know, even if you just have a story, tell us your story so we can embellish the year with it. So when we're talking about the year, it's not just, well, this is the float that year, and here's its rendering, and, you know, here's some of the things that happened that year. But we can embellish it with a story that says, hey, you know, the floral glue spilled on Steve that year. I mean, that's a good story. Uh -huh. And those are the types of stories that we need that, that help bring the history to life. Because it's not just about us and then also spreading the, the knowledge through the years. It's also about bringing back, like as an example, trying to get, build a new lab. 
and we're trying to look for donations. <laughs> <laughs> He's a talking about his hands again. <laughs> You're not following. Anyway, <laughs> stop. It. Okay. No. <laughs> okay. You got I don't me. You got me crying though. Good. Yeah. Good. What's the anyway. matter? Have fun with it. Okay. Tell your stories with it. And let's use those stories to help advance the program. Yes, because those stories will help donors realize what it's done for people. And there's a lot of folks that have been able to take their rose flow experience and be successful with it. Thank you very much. Our pleasure. <laughs>